It's January 26th, 2021. Welcome to the OSU Specialty Crops Team and Ohio Controlled Environment Agriculture Center Virtual High Tunnel School. The school is a live weekly seminar and discussion for current and potential high tunnel users. Classes are held live via Zoom at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 11.30 a.m. Central Time, every Tuesday from January 12th through February 16th, totaling six sessions. Today is session number three. Thank you for joining us. We recognize there is a lot of competition for your time, so we appreciate your sharing some of it with us. I'm Carrie Jagger, the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator in Morrow County with Ohio State University Extension. I will serve as your host and moderator for today's session. We will welcome and hear from our presenters soon. However, before getting into the subject matter, we must cover a bit of background to help you get the most from joining us. First, Please note that you currently cannot be heard or seen. Your audio and video transmission are currently blocked. I'm currently the only one that can be seen and heard. Second, your video will remain off throughout the class, but you have two options for communicating with me, the presenters and other attendees during class. The first way is to use the chat feature available by clicking chat at the bottom of your window. This will open a box allowing you to type a comment and direct it to everyone or someone you select. The second way to communicate with us and others is to use the Q&A option. To use that option, click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your page and type in your question. We will answer questions when the speaker is finished with their presentation and some may be answered throughout uh, by typing them in. But I ask that you please, if you have a question, put it in that Q&A tab because it can get lost in that chat section. If the question is not answered today, it will be addressed after class. All registrants will receive a follow-up email containing responses to questions and comments placed in the chat box. That covers how to communicate with us during the session, so let's get started. Today, we'll cover pesticide selection and foliar tomato disease management. We have three guests you are sure to enjoy hearing from on that overall topic. Joining us today are Melanie Ivey, Assistant Professor, Development of Plant Department of Plant Pathology and Extension Fruit Pathologist and Fresh Produce Safety Specialist. Francesca Rotundo from the Department of Plant Pathology and Sally Miller, Distinguished Professor of Food, Agriculture and Environmental Sciences in Plant Pathology with the Department of Plant Pathology. Sally won't pre be presenting today, but she is available for questions. Melanie will be presenting about allowable recommended pesticides for high tunnels and Francesca will be speaking about foliar tomato disease management. Melanie, let me turn the floor over to you. What should we know about allowable recommended pesticides for high tunnels? Okay, thank you. You won't believe what my cat is just doing. So if you hear something in the background, I apologize. <laughs> oh, perfect timing, Pepper. Okay, I am going to share my screen here. Can you, are you seeing it? I see a bunch of different windows. There we go, Melanie. We've got your presentation right there. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to actually keep this pretty general. In terms of selecting pesticides, what I wanted to focus on in this uh, presentation was that is that there is a difference between uh, the pesticides, in this case, uh, fungicides I focus on, that you can use in a greenhouse versus those that you're allowed to use in the open field. And so when you're selecting a pesticide, for use in high tunnels, you have to make sure that that pesticide is actually registered for and allowed to be used in a high tunnel. And so I'm just gonna give you some background on how you can determine whether or not the fungicide or, pest or insecticide for that matter that you're wanting to use is allowable uh, in your high tunnel. So the, the main thing that I wanna point out is that this is the pesticide that you can use is regulated based on the EPA and it's actually the worker protection standard 
that dictates whether or not you can use a specific pesticide for your high tunnel. And so the definition that they use in order to determine whether or not you can use a specific pesticide uh, is using terminology that's not the same as greenhouse or is the same as greenhouse, but not the actual term greenhouse. And so for that, am I here still? Can you see me still? Yep, not your presentation, Melanie, just you. Oh, I don't know what happened. <sighs> Sorry about that. Can you see it now? Nope, not yet. <sighs> okay, let me try again. Looks good. Okay, I apologize for that. All right, so the, the definition that we refer to um, is that the production of an agricultural plant indoors or in a structure space that is covered in whole or in part by any non-porous covering. And that is large enough to permit a person to enter. So that's the definition of an enclosed production environment and that is what they refer to when they use the term greenhouse or high tunnel or, or whatever the enclosed structure is. And that's how you determine whether or not you can use that pesticide. And so a couple of things I wanna point out is that it, it states in whole or in part, because often we'll get the question, well, with a high tunnel, we can roll up the sides. So is that still considered an enclosed production environment? And the answer is yes. The other question that we sometimes uh, get well is if we, you know, put screens on part a portion of it, can we then, you know, consider it not to be an enclosed production environment? And the answer is no. And so you have to pay attention to um, what the definition is in order for you to be able to then select the pesticide that's allowed to be used within the high tunnel. Okay, so here are a couple examples, a few examples of what a closed production environments would be. And keeping in mind that they have to be of a size that you can walk into, they don't necessarily have to be fully enclosed, they can be partially or partially enclosed and that the material that's made up is, is non-porous. So here's an example of a greenhouse or a glass house. This is an enclosed production environment. High tunnels or hoop houses, if the material that is used on it is uh, non-porous, then that would be an enclosed production environment. And then things like mushroom or rhubarb houses are also considered enclosed environments. And therefore, you have to pay attention to the label to determine whether or not you can use the pesticide in there. So examples of porous structures that are not considered enclosed production environments, these would be your screen houses. So in this case, this is a, a porous structure and therefore is not considered an enclosed production environment. And then sometimes if it if you're in a urban area and you're working on a rooftop, you might have a screened house and that also is not considered an enclosed environment. So in this case, the, the pesticide that you select could be the same one, for instance, that you would use in the field. So where do you find the information? Well, you have to refer to the label and the label is the law. And these labels can be complex and sometimes it can be hard to find the information that you're looking for. But in order to be allowed to use it in your high tunnel, it must say that it is labeled for greenhouse production and it must include the crops. So in this case, um, this is just an example of Fontellus, which is often used um, for tomato and pepper diseases. And you can see that it's clearly says may be used in greenhouse production. So that means that if you have a high tunnel 
and it has a pore structure on it, you can also use it in, in your high tunnel. And then it states which crops that it can be used on. If it specifically says that you cannot use it for a greenhouse, then you cannot use it in your high tunnel or in any other enclosed environment that meets the, the worker protection standard definition. And so here it clearly says on approvia that do not apply to tomatoes grown in the greenhouse. Okay, so this clearly states you can't. The, the, um, the other label, Fontellus, clearly says you can, but what about labels that don't say anything? We call this a silent label. And this is if there is no mention on the label of it being allowed for greenhouse use or there's no specific restrictions. And I've just taken a screenshot here of the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for Commercial Growers. And they clearly have, they have a nice clear table that tells you whether or not you can use a product for greenhouse use. And so if you look down this column, you'll see the term silent, which means that the product label does not mention greenhouse use or any specific crop, and therefore you can use it in your high tunnel. And different states have different regulations. And so I know we have someone here, I saw from, we saw from Arizona, you need to make sure that you check with your state on this. And so I actually called up the Ohio Department of Ag last week just to confirm that this hasn't changed. And so for a silent label in Ohio, a silent label means that you're allowed to use it in a high tunnel or um, in a hoop house. So where can you find pesticide labels? There, there are several resources for you to get it. The first is that the label should always be on the bottle or the bag of the product you buy. Do not remove that label, it needs to stay attached to it. So if you want a copy of the label, you, you have a few other um, sources that you can get it from. One, you can call the manufacturer or you can call your vendor or your seller and you can get it from them. Uh, if you have access to the internet, there are several online resources and I've listed three of them here, a uh, green book, the CDMS, and then the EPA government website. And actually this is my new favorite one. I used to really like the CDMS net and I still use it, but I've found that the EPA website actually provides a bit more information in that it actually indicates which label is the most current label because sometimes, well, not sometimes, often they'll revise the label as they make changes. And that doesn't always get, those labels don't always get uploaded into CDMS or Green Book right away whereas on the EPA website, they do. And so this just shows you what this EPA website looks like. What you do is you search, you select search for a product when you go to the main page, and then you can tape, type in the product name. So in this case, I typed in ActiGuard. You can also type in, um, you can also type in the active ingredient if you want. And you can see under the labels tab that it lists all the labels and it tells you what data is accepted. So this is the most current label here. And then when you click on it, it will also have this accepted stamp on it. So this tells you that this is the most current label. And so sometimes, you know, over time they might get greenhouse use or use in a, an enclosed uh, production environment and that might get added to the label. So this is where you can find the most up-to-date information on the product. And then you can see that it gives you tabs for a whole bunch of other um, information that might be relevant, including um, site, which is the state, and then also the various pests that um, are labeled for use. Okay, so when in doubt, you need to ask. So you should never assume that a fungicide or an insecticide is registered for use in a greenhouse or in a hoop house. You should always check the label and confirm it. And if you're not sure still, if you can't find 
the information you're looking for, please ask. So you can contact um, one, of, one of us, Sally or, or myself, or another OSU Extension Specialist, and you can also contact your county extension educators. In Ohio, you can contact the Ohio Department of Agriculture. They're very responsive. Um, I was able to talk to Greg immediately and, and confirm the information that I wanted. So I put up here the contact information for where you can reach someone at the ODA. And I just gave an example of the first two counties on the County Extension Office website. You can find your county and go there to, to find out who to contact and get the contact information for them. So I think the, the biggest take home message that I have is that you should, you sh if you don't know, you should ask and never make the assumption that the pesticide can be used in a greenhouse or in a high tunnel. Always confirm that first. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, if, you, if you need to reach me, as, as Carrie mentioned, I'm the fruit pathologist and fresh produce safety specialist. And uh, you're going to be hearing from Francesca and Sally next on some of the diseases that you might encounter in the high tunnel and where you might need to use a specific fungicide. And if it can be labeled or not, you would want to refer to the label, if it can be used or not. So that's all I have. You're muted, Carrie. Thanks, Melanie, sorry. Does anybody have any questions for Melanie on using labels or reading and understanding labels? Uh, we had a couple questions in the question and answer, but Sally took care of those, I believe. And there were some comments about organic options, but I think Francesca is gonna cover those next. Yeah. Okay. If it's okay, I had one question. Sorry, Melanie, I'll cut you off. Go ahead, finish your, finish your thought. Uh, the same, I, I didn't actually put an example of a organic product up and I don't know offhand of any that would not be allowed in a greenhouse or high tunnel, but the same thing applies. You would want to check the label to make sure uh, if the organic product can be used in an enclosed production environment. Uh, so Melanie, the question that I had, um, I, put, I placed it in the chat just, just for background. Uh, of course, a uh, number of people on the on the line here will ha do have pesticide licenses, and others are operating without one. So they're they're probably relying on over, what I would call over the counter, you know, crop protectants and the like. Um, are the comments that you just shared more or less it, applicable to all of those, or is there a special category for over the? I mean, special comments for over the counter stuff, so to speak. No, not there isn't. It's still, as Sally put in there, the label is the law. And so you would still have to refer to the label. And again, if it doesn't mention it, if it doesn't mention it can be used in a greenhouse, that would be a silent label. And then so you could use it. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I think about, if I think about it, I think Mankazeb, for instance, actually has a mention of greenhouse on on the label of the over-the-counter product. But the same thing applies, the labels, the law. And those labels are a little bit harder to find. They are on the EPA website. And then often, um, if you go to the store, wherever you're purchasing it online, they'll if you scroll down to the very bottom of their pages, you'll see that there's a, a link that you can download their labels. All right, if we don't have any more questions for Melanie, we'll move on um, to our next speaker. Uh, we'll now be moving on to our next topic, Francesca. Let me turn the floor over to you. What should we know about foliar tomato disease management in high tunnels? Okay, thank you, Kerry. Uh, my name is uh, Francesca Rotondo and I work in the Department of Plant Pathology, mainly on vegetable diseases uh, with Dr. Sally Miller. And so here you have also our uh, contact information in case you wanna reach out to us uh, later. 
So before starting to talk uh, the, uh, about the most common diseases, uh, we heard uh, so many times in all uh, these uh, um, talks that high tunnels and greenhouse are um, micro environment. So really different in terms of condition from a field. And so of course, being this condition different, we have also different diseases. So when we are going to oh, see um, which uh, are those conditions, for instance, in high tunnel, uh, we usually have higher humidity than in a field. And instead, we don't have rain splashes in a high tunnel while we have it in the field and it's always a big problem, especially in bacterial diseases. In both um, em uh, environments, the mechanical operation can uh, constitute a problem in terms of uh, propagating the disease through the field. As uh, uh, Dr. Avi has uh, covered really well, the pesticide application and the rules are really, um, can be different. And so again, I wanted to stress out how it's important to uh, check always the label and be sure that the product that you're going to use is allowed in your eye tunnel and greenhouse. So then we have in these other two columns, the most common diseases, and I'm going to cover some of that for the fungal and bacterial uh, diseases. So the first one that I wanna talk about is Botrytis gray mold. Uh, Botrytis uh, like, uh, um, is a fungus and it likes, uh, likes cool and damp condition. For this reason, it's also favored uh, by a dense foliage because when we have a lot of canopy, of course, the excess of leaf create uh, a higher uh, humidity um, among, uh, present uh, among the plants. The typical symptoms uh, are usually uh, sporulation that we can see on the top of the fruits, anywhere we can observe at early stage or also a ripe stage. But botrytis can also cause uh, extensive um, damage on the stem, extensive lesion, with uh, usually browning of these open wounds. Another interesting uh, symptoms where we have uh, to look for is what we call ghost spot. And as you see in this picture, um, there is a um, greener, area with a dark green surrounded by a light green halo. This is called ghost spot because it's an um, infection that was starting, but then aborted because the condition weren't favorable anymore. So it's good that it didn't start, it didn't continue to affect your crop, but this means that botrytis was present. So um, stay on the lookout for these kind of symptoms because there was a source of inoculum that was able to enter your high tunnel. And the last picture uh, on the top of the ghost spot pictures is uh, how botrytis looks under a microscope when we receive a sample is how we look at it. And this is velvety, really high sporulation. And this is uh, good in some extent because it's really noticeable also when it's on your crop. Similar uh, in terms of sporulation, uh, we can see in these pictures, is uh, leaf mold. Difference uh, for leaf mold that this, uh, the mycelia mat and the spores, that is always uh, is, um, a fungus that we're dealing with, is uh, present on the underside of the leaf. What would you observe on the uh, upper side of the leaf Instead is a yellow discoloration. And when you turn the leaf, you will see those mycelia mat. On the fruit is uh, usually create uh, a bronzing discoloration. And this can often uh, be confused with another type of disease that is always caused by a fungus, but is a uh, um, late blight uh, caused by Phytophthora infest. Those bronze uh, discoloration that we saw on the fruits here are usually accompanied by uh, fluffy um, 
white mycelia. And we will never see that in a uh, um, leaf mold. That is really important. I always like to point out the typical symptoms because then when you scout, that is really important uh, while taking care of your eye tunnel, you can also start knowing the symptoms, you start to discriminate with, with pathogen you are dealing. Phytophthora also is able to sporulate underneath and uh, also above the side of the leaf and is always white in color, like almost powder sugar. And uh, unfortunately, this is a pathogen that can uh, take down the crop really quickly if it's not controlled. So it's really important to um, uh, uh, be prompt. I have a prompt reaction. Also comparing to the previous diseases, uh, uh, tomato late blight is uh, uh, like a, um, better. Uh, so it grows as more conducive in cooler condition. And so it's all often see in autumn. As bacterial diseases, the most important one that is a big problem, both in greenhouse uh, and uh, um, high tunnel, but also in the field, is bacterial canker of tomato caused uh, by Clavibacter michiganiensis. This is a systemic disease. When we say systemic disease, it mainly say that it's going to colonize the vessel of the plant. So when we cut the stem, uh, we will see a brown area corresponding to uh, the vessel of the plant. So the bacteria is starting to colonize and it will obstruct the vessel, creating in the most severe cases, wilting. As a foliar symptoms, we can see bleaching of, uh, of the leaf, but also a typical symptoms is what we call firing. It seems that the leaf uh, was uh, um, caught on fire, and so you see just necrotic edges around. This is a disease that is a, a seed transmitter, so it enters in the greenhouse, usually by seed, infected seeds, but can also enter in a high tunnel of greenhouse with transplants or grafted plants, and usually goes undetected because those plants are asymptomatic, but then the uh, other um, really, uh, I would say, bad things about this disease that is mechanically transmitted. So if you have an asymptomatic plant, but you work in your high tunnel uh, and with uh, clipping, trimming, then you will move, if there is a symptomatic plant, you will move the disease through uh, all uh, your crop. Another source of the inoculum are what we call um, volunteer host and an exam um, sorry alternative host and an example could be pepper but also volunteering tomato so it is also a good uh, practice to always clean up your uh, high tunnel and all the surrounding of your high tunnel um, by volunteer plants um, and even weeds the viral disease can be a problem and in uh, this slide, I divided in two main categories according to the transmission. So we have the tospovirus uh, diseases that are transmitted by trips, so by insects, and uh, the tobamo viruses uh, that are instead seed and mechanically transmitted. For the tospoviruses, the symptoms are pretty uh, typical. Usually discoloration of the fruits, chlorotic discoloration of the fruits, and ring uh, spot around the fruits and also on the leaf, and also bumpy and, def uh, and deformed fruits. And in this picture, we can see some of the examples. This is a tomato spotted wilt virus and tomato chlorotic spot virus. For uh, the tomato um, tobacco virus, the two most important diseases are the tobacco mosaic virus and a relatively new disease that is tomato brown rugose fruit virus. The uh, tobacco mosaic virus usually present uh, distorted and deformed leaves and is uh, really easy to uh, uh, spot. And uh, usually it's also always recommended to don't handle cigarette uh, and tobacco when you work 
with tomato because that could also be a, a way of spread. The uh, to uh, tomato brown rugos virus instead is, a, I say, is a relatively new disease because in the US it's been detected but eradicated. But this disease uh, cause is a big problem in uh, um, Canada and Mexico. And it seems also, even if it belongs to the same family of the tobacco mosaic virus, it seems really more resilient to um, the uh, classic management approach to control this disease. And also the disinfection, it seems uh, don't work that well for this virus. So it is a, on the radar of everybody that works with tomato and is a main concern right now. So for the management, uh, I saw that there were some uh, question in the uh, chat. And so in the, in the next slide, I'm going to talk of what we call a disease integrated management. And his approach uh, using different uh, approach to try to control at our best uh, capability, the, um, the diseases. So the first, uh, since we saw that some diseases can be introduced with seed and transplant, it's really important to use clean seed and free uh, pathogen free transplant. For the uh, clean seeds, uh, for sake of times, I will not talk about these in depth, but you can find at the following link, um, the, uh, our fact sheets about uh, seed sanitation through hot water treatment and chlorine treatment. And this is proven uh, to be really effective to eradicate both fungal and uh, bacterial and viral pathogens. Then another option that you can rely on is choose resistant varieties. I reported here a link for the University of Cornell where uh, you, if you go and visit this page, there are uh, reported uh, all the different tomato varieties and for each varieties is going to be reported for which disease uh, the varieties are resistant. And then of course, the last two points and we will see in the next slide, use appropriate culture, cultural practices and use the crop protect so the ones that Dr. Ivy has talked about in terms of labor. So for cultural practices, it's uh, always uh, good to have a nice protocol in terms of uh, sanitation and uh, remove all the sources of, of inoculum. So in that sense, all coal pile, weeds, and those alternative hosts has been removed. And at the end of, uh, um, and also when we talk about uh, the environment, we say that humidity is a, a key factor. So keep the humidity as low as you can and avoid abrupt change of temperature because that will create condensation. Condensation is a wa water available for the pathogen to thrive. And again, the good sanitation protocol that I was talking about Always clean and disinfect all your structure at the end of the season, and that will uh, um, ensure a clean environment for the next crop. Clothing and equipment uh, has to be clean uh, regularly, so as well the tools, because we saw that mechanical transmission can be a problem. Mechanical transmission can be also through visitors, so always have foot bath and uh, destroy so and also limit your visitors in terms of insect is hard to exclude totally exclude the insect especially from a high tunnel but try to limit and have a um, sticky trap so you can monitor which um, unwanted visitors you are going to have in your high tunnel for common disinfected in this table so here i report the main categories and uh, the take home message of this slide is basically that Clorox 10% and Vircon at 2% were active against the most of the common uh, pathogen that I presented here today. 
So if we usually recommend Clorox uh, to our grower for uh, cleaning tools and um, structures. And for fungicide labeled in greenhouse and high tunnel, here uh, is one uh, of the table um, uh, with the most common, uh, some of the fungicide that are labeled in conventional uh, um, crops. And uh, in the column is also reported uh, the disease uh, that are effective against. And also the last column, and that would be interesting comparing to the next slide when we have the organic product, the post-harvest interval is always a good thing to keep in mind when you spray mm -hmm. so you know when then you can harvest. And at the, so if you want more information about the uh, other fungicide, you can find good resources at the North Carolina State um, Extension page and at this link, you can find more um, products listed. For biocontrol alternatives, we have uh, several and are not that many, but the interesting things that PHI is really low, is basically there is almost no PHI. We have just regalia that has a four hours PHI. And the most common disease seems to be uh, nicely controlled for some of these. Also, this table is taken from the NC State extension, and you can still um, use this resource. And they will always, they, these sites, also our sites, are always updated depending on the field trial and research that goes on. And uh, I'm close, this is all. I got. We have, uh, we are a vegetable pathology lab. Dr. Miller is uh, the um, professor that manage, uh, distinguished professor that manage the lab. And you can follow her at the, uh, all these um, link, her blog, the fact sheets, and uh, uh, Twitter. That is always uh, the fastest way to have the uh, recent updates. For any question, we are here to answer. Uh, Francesca, Matt made a comment. Um, he said, consider commenting on the overall role of grafting and foliar versus soil borne disease management. <laughs> I, I, I know that the soil borne disease management, I think, will be the next. So we did it, we included more um, on the uh, um, foliar, right? But uh, so what I can say about the grafting, um, grafting can be, uh, when you use grafting in terms of these diseases that I presented, can be a problem, especially with canker, because grafting is an open wound, right? So if, uh, if uh, uh, then there is clavibacter, that could be a susceptible um, point of infection. I think and I'll, uh, there should be a Matt knows that I always personally forget uh, the, the link, but there is a good resources about grafting um, and uh, listing all the rootstock and the eventual resistance they will provide to your crop. And of course, yeah, Matt, if you want to fill in, I never go fast. I don't want to uh, uh, disrupt the flow of the website you might have been thinking of, uh, Francesca, is vegetablegrafting.org. It's one word. I think so. Yeah, I always ask you periodically at the end of uh, other there you find resources, including those of diagnostic. So I think that there are uh, good answer to is a nice resource. Uh, someone asked, what are the best practices when pruning to reduce disease transmission? Like how often to spray or dip your, your pruners, your clippers, change your gloves, et cetera. Is, uh, um, we always uh, recommend basically every cut you, you redeep in your uh, Clorox is uh, because every cut then could be the, so you want to disinfect between cuts. Now you guys, you and Sally both, I guess, yeah. you and Sally both now have mentioned Clorox and Sally said a 10% solution. Yeah. Um, should they 
tell them how I guess they should dilute that from the container. Clorox to water. <laughs> so if you have, it's just commercial bleach. So 10% means that you, if you have 10 milliliters of uh, bleach, you add other 100 milliliters of water and that makes your 10%. And Sally mentioned a product called Vercon. Where would they get that at? Amazon. Okay. <laughs> But okay. they can also get it, I'm pretty sure, you know, the, the um, pesticide vendors would probably have it okay. as well. I, I'll mention with Clorox that it's really important, and Sally has it in there, that you should always make sure your tools are clean yep. and yep. free of debris first. Um, otherwise, the Clorox will... Yep. Yeah, that is another important point. If there is like a soil debris will not work. So it's always good to. Uh, somebody asked a question. Uh, I see non-fat dry milk listed as a preventative slash disinfectant. Can you discuss more in depth and at what proportions to use? Um, they read about it over 20 years briefly in American horticulture, but they haven't seen much on it since. <laughs> yeah, I... I at, at the top of my head, I don't remember the, the proportion, but it's a, um, so the portion of how, which percent, was that 2%? I, it's, it's really effective fat milk, usually with some of the viral diseases, is still used. As a, I don't think it's effective for the ones that we uh, talk about in terms, but I think TMV, is one of those that uh, could be uh, take care by uh, do the your sanitation with fat milk. Um, so I can we can look back so I can I can follow up with the exact um, dosage or how to make the mixture. Okay, cool. Thank you, Francesca. Um, somebody said the U dot OS. U.edu veggie disease facts doesn't that link isn't working and I actually clicked on it and it didn't go anywhere either hmm. so I don't know if maybe it's down for some reason looks like Sally's town uh okay. we've had a couple comments on neem oil the use of neem oil Francesca mm -hmm. that would be Celeste wealthy <laughs> is the expertise so usually when I, um, when I participate in crop walk, the neem oil always come up as an um, insecticide and uh, to take care of insects specifically. I think I never heard about um, for fungal pathogens. So I, I can't really say too much uh, for, for my side, probably Sally or Anna or Melanie have more, um, know something more, but um, we can look into that and also eventually put in contact with entomologists if the problem is uh, more insecticide. So th the nice things of OSU that we have, we are a big network. And so if we can't, so we don't have a short answer, we can, we have other expertise uh, for like insects. And, yeah, so. Um, someone asked about getting copies of the fact sheets. Uh, I know a lot of the copies of the fact sheets that you guys mentioned are on your yeah, so our own pathology online. website. Yes, and you can uh, you can print it, but you can also are if you have access to the computer, are all online, so you can consult them. Is a uh, really nice. The website is organized by crop and by disease at night tunnel or um, in the field, the bacterial fungus. So it's, uh, it's easy and uh, friendly to, to interact the interface. So our, um, and if you can't get to those, you can contact me and I will <laughs> create PDF and uh, uh, try to, to make sure that you can have access to those. 
even so with uh, web extension. I want to try the site again because I'm getting it to work. Um, it unless you have a high tunnel disease facts is that what you have written there? Yeah, well, that's one of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, tunnel disease fact. Okay. Yeah, that one is working. Okay. The one above it, I think, was the one that wasn't. Okay. Okay. I just posted the correct link in the chat. Ah, excellent. Anna posted the correct link to their website in the chat. And I know a lot of the fact sheets that Francesca has talked about are on their website. Thanks, Anna. Uh, somebody's asking regarding uh, the sulfur for PM, it's pretty much our only problem, powdery mildew, it's pretty much our only problem with tomatoes and our high tunnel but there isn't a lot of information regarding application and post-harvest interval. Do you have a resource for that? I can look to that. I don't know if Sally- Sally's uh, type, it looks like yeah, Sally's exactly. typing an answer now. So she may be on <laughs> that, that one. In terms of application, yeah, she's the ones. Uh, there's one question here. I know fungal spores are almost in, in definitely viable. What about bacterium and viruses? Okay, so um, clavibac, so the, the canker, the, so we talk about uh, tomato canker, unfortunately is a really resilient uh, pathogen. So it can survive up five years. So this is why it's really important to sanitize. And especially when you have a problem of tomato canker, you eradicate your plants you don't keep it there and you try to isolate the area that is affected so to don't uh, be able to uh, transmit um, further. And uh, for the tomato brown rugos virus, um, it actually seems like, is, as we say, it's kind of a new disease for us, but uh, it seems a lot of more resistant to treatment and also normal sanitation product, uh, protocols and timing, it seems to don't affect specifically. So is uh, yeah, is um, some are really resilient rather than other. But yeah, in terms of uh, tomato canker, is a is a bad one. <laughs> Francesca, you had talked about that ghost spot early on in your mm -hmm. presentation and it had the little rings on the tomatoes. Does it mm -hmm. grow out of that or will you see those rings once that tomato ripens? I think there will be still remain um, marks. Okay. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how uh, can compromise the marketable of the fruits, but it's, uh, I think it's more a, a alert sign when you have it because yeah, it's, it seems that this, the fungus is there. Is there? Oh, circles are remain. Okay. Yep, Sally said they all remain. I I've got a question I was thinking about before this. Um, I know in like annual flower production, they use silica or they're using silica as a product to kind of um, prevent or protect the plants from diseases. Are is anyone using this in high tunnel or is it used in, in vegetable production at all? Do, do any of you know the answer to that? I don't. <laughs> have you no. heard anything on that in our mat? Yeah, Johnny? I have a little bit on tomato. Um, so tomato is like a root accumulator of silica. There's foliar and root accumulators of silica and tomato is more of a root accumulator. Um, there's one paper out of Louisiana State that showed some impact in reducing um, Fusarium crown rot, but it's not really extensively been studied in high tunnel vegetable production. But um, if you stay tuned, that's something that'll come out of my program in a few years. It's something we're going to look at. Cool. Okay. Well, I, I tried it um, for pepper and bacterial spot when I was at Louisiana State, and it, it really wasn't, wasn't very effective. And they've also tried it on um, cucurbits as well with varying levels of um, effectiveness. It's a question that comes up a lot. There's, there is a lot of information out there on, on it as a potential plant inducer, but not a lot of reliable data. Thanks. 
Uh, pruning and suckering, is that a good way to help reduce some of these problems with disease in high tunnel? And when should they start doing that or thinking about doing it? Yeah, definitely is uh, something. So when we were talking about foliage, right? So is the sucking, I would say, when we have our experiment, we start to suck fairly early, immediately. So when, when it's fresh, also because if you wait too much, then will be a bigger open wound that you, so instead at the early stage. And so everything also when you start to have a dense foliage at the lower branch for tomatoes or the lower part of the uh, plant, that is something that you don't need for your production. So we always, uh, is there so that, that you have to kind of um, favor the airflow along your lines. Harry, hey, that's an excellent question. And I, I think it demands a little bit more time than what we might have here. I, I do know from a horticultural perspective that pruning and suckering has real impact on the crop, uh, the, the plants, uh, the, the, the growth of the shoot, and also the size and perhaps a number of the fruit. And it varies by variety, uh, plant population, and other components of the program. So it is an act, it's actually an active area of, of research, uh, both on station and on farm. Judd Reed of Cornell University is, is active in the area. I've done some work in the area. I would just encourage people to stay tuned for information about pruning and suckering their high tunnel tomatoes, because as we introduce grafting into the conversation, we talk about the different maturities of um, varieties and the different types of fruit they produce and the markets that you're selling to. Uh, pruning and suckering takes on a, an additional meaning beyond the foliar disease component that we have heard so much about today, which is extremely important. And yes, I mean, as Sally's put in the, in the chat and uh, Francesca has emphasized earlier, definitely reduces, um, you know, improves airflow and so on. So it can help with disease management, but it may also have additional benefits and associated challenges. So like every time you prune, you're wounding. So you have to weigh the pros and cons against, uh, you know, going forward. So it's just an area that we should pay, I think, close attention to going forward. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've had this question several times today, and they're asking, do you disinfect the walls of your high tunnel? And what should you use to clean your high tunnel between seasons? I let answer this to Anna. Does she always work? <laughs> Well, this is actually, Sally and I had discussed this for a high tunnel grower in Ohio a while ago. And, you know, not every disease is going to survive on the surfaces, but just good practices. If you can uh, wash those walls down with a hot soapy water, rinse it off, and then do a rinse with 10% Clorox, and then wash that off as well, you know, that should take care of almost anything that would be an issue. You know, that's kind of going above and beyond for sanitation, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Is that, is that, uh, Anna, sorry to op open up the conversation further, but, but I presume that that approach is, is um, will accommodate if a crop is already in the tunnel, uh, such as a leafy vegetable crop or seedlings of another crop that's following the tomatoes, if that's what people are thinking about right now. Yeah, you could apply that treatment to your sidewalls of your high tunnel when a crop is in there. I mean, just don't be splashing the soapy water and Clorox all over, you know, control it along the wall. Yeah, as Sally also um, stressed out, is uh, is also important to, again, remove weeds and volunteer tomatoes because as was said before, it can be alternative hosts. And yeah, for some of the virus can be also a big problem to have alternative also. So maybe you are, you are really clean in your right tunnel, but then you have weeds all around, then can still be a source of the inoculum also, even if you think it's outside, will is likely to come in. I put a link in the in the chat as well for a fact sheet on um leaf pruning and sanitation practices to manage botrytis gray mold in the greenhouse. 
Uh, we've got a question here. When transferring mm -hmm. tomatoes from outside into a high tunnel or vice versa, particularly when growing indeterminate varieties, is there any specific treatments or protocols you would recommend to directly treat the plant and soil with to prevent diseases from developing and spreading between plants and new seedlings when continuing plants beyond the season. So, um, well, of course, being, so as we say, the cleanest as you can. So when you use tool, of course, was the, the disinfection of your tools that is, uh, uh, sometimes some, as we say, some of the uh, diseases go undetected at transplant, but always uh, scout your plants before moving it in um, in your eye tunnel for eventual symptoms. And uh, in terms of treatment that can be applied, I'll pass also this answer to some of the other panelists. <laughs> So for the last section or the last session of this series, I'll be talking specifically about soil borne diseases and high tunnels. But in general, if you're starting transplants or moving plants around, make sure you're always using new or clean potty, pots and make sure you're using potting soil. You don't wanna be, or potting mix, a soil is potting mix. You don't wanna be moving soil um, between your fields because in all likelihood, you'll be moving pathogens along with that soil. Thanks, Anna. Uh, someone asks, are there any other considerations or risks associated with an urban growing space? And we might talk about this in another session, I'm not sure, but is there anything they should be concerned about? Mm, I don't have any <laughs> particular thoughts on I guess my only thought would be is if there was an old garage or something there that maybe contaminated the soil before you put your high tunnel there. It's good to know, I guess, what was there previously. But as far as disease. It's always a good, a good uh, practice. So before putting a high tunnel also to do some soil analysis and testing, that is always recommended. Since then it's not easy to move them. <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's better to know. Um, and, and before, I don't know if all the um, attendees has followed the previous um, session, but yeah, it was really nice when uh, all the check uh, list that you have to follow to have uh, the, the best place where you can start to put your uh, height on. And so that's definitely something that you need to consider before starting. Well, we got about one minute. So our session is about, about ready to end. We've had great discussion today. Thank you, um, panelists. As we wrap up, I wanna thank Melanie, Francesca, Sally, and Anna for sharing their expertise and experience and thank all of you for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed the time. This has been the third of the six scheduled sessions of this school. So please join us for the remaining sessions and look for follow-up communication by email, including messages containing information on where you can learn more and share in response to questions and comments you shared. Again, thank you for your participation in the OSU Specialty Crops Team and Ohio Controlled Environment Agriculture Center Virtual High Tunnel School. Good luck and stay in touch. We hope to see you all next week. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice to be here.